Welcome to episode 100 of Diffuse Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. I'm Omar Ansari, and I'm joined again, as always, by Pervez Ahmed. This is part two of what turned out to be quite an in-depth conversation with Imam Hadi Ghazwini regarding the history, theology, and common practices of Shiism. If you haven't had a chance to listen to part one, you can do so in episode 99 of the podcast. If you have heard it already, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conversation, and inshallah, you'll find it as enlightening and educational as we did. I wanted to ask a quick question. Um, without knowing a lot about some of the things you've just been talking about, which is 12 or um, lineage, that sort of thing. So I'm, my questions are, why 12? And, and what's the root What's the root source of this belief? And, and is, it based, is it based on like lineage? Like who picks the imam and that sort of thing? And, it is, and, 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 and not just what, what's the belief is, but what's the root, uh, uh, the root source of that belief? And then all the way up to the Mahdi, because like Barbez alluded to earlier, um, Sunnis believe in the Mahdi. Is that, is that similar or different? So that, that would really help me. Sure, those are all excellent questions. So uh, one thing that I would say is that why 12? So the Shi'i theologians, when they're discussing this concept of the imama, of course, you can imagine it's very elaborate. They're talking about all of these different aspects. So one thing that comes up is um, that, look, um, the previous prophets, previous major prophets were given successors as well, disciples. And so the, this example of Moses having 12 disciples sort of the 12 tribes, if you will, uh, Jesus having 12 disciples. So this number 12 is something that appears in the history of sort of humanity, in the history of the divine message. Um, uh, uh, but then there's this emphasis that, look, the, the real source of this is the prophetic designation. Um, yes, they were all um, uh, sort of uh, uh, descendants of one another. So you have Ali, and then you have his elder son, Hassan, and then Hussein, the younger son, but then the rest come through the line of Hussein as, you know, father, son, father, son. Um, And so um, sort of the justification that's given for that is that, you know, that the prophet actually appointed them. And then, you know, sort of you have within, even within Sunni tradition, this idea of the khulafa, the successors having to be from Quraysh. Um, you know, this would develop into sort of an important uh, sort of Sunni understanding. And so, so that, that succession would be limited to Quraysh and of course, Bani Hashim being from Quraysh and, and, and even some traditions even bringing up this number. Uh, and so the Shia would kind of point to those traditions and say, well, look, you know, these are traditions that are rec- recognized in, in the Sunni sources about the successors being from Quraysh and being 12. And if you look at the Umayyads, if you look at the Abbasids, none of them were 12. It's only sort of this, you know, this line of Muslim tradition that recognizes these 12 uh, uh, beings. So, I mean, you know, there are several arguments, but again, we have to see sort of uh, later theologians when they're, when they're justifying these beliefs. Um, and this, this occurs over time. This occurs over time within the Shia tradition, within the Sunni tradition, you have scholars who are sitting down and they're writing books about the imama and they're all of these aspects of the imama. And they're coming up with various scriptural and rational kind of justifications uh, for these uh, beliefs. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, in particular, the Mahdi, when we come to the Mahdi, um, again, you know, within Islamic tradition as a whole, there's this understanding that the Mahdi is, is this Messiah figure who appears before the end of the world. And he kind of joins with Jesus, uh, uh, with Jesus Christ, Prophet uh, uh, Isa, uh, peace be upon him, and um, and sort of they bring about a period of justice uh, uh, and goodness before the end of time. Um, and so this belief is there. It's not emphasized as much in the Sunni tradition. Um, some are aware, um, not. Too many people are aware of this sort of uh, of this belief within the, the the Sunni tradition. Most probably are, but they're not really probably not aware of the details. So the the main difference between the Sunni and the Shi'i um, views of the Mahdi is that the Sunni tradition considers this figure to uh, uh, emerge, possibly be born before the end of times. Correct. Whereas the Shi'i uh, tradition holds that he was born. In the year 255 after Hijrah, in the third century, he was born. He went into what are, are known as a period, two periods of occultation or ghaibah, 
disappearance, basically. The first lasted from the year 260 after Hijra to the year 329, about 70 years. And then the second started from the year 329 after Hijra and continues indefinitely before the end of time. So 12 Shi'i belief is that the 12th Imam became hidden. It's not that there's kind of a misconception that he's in a, in a different realm or something like that, or he ascended to the heavens. That's, that's, not, the, that's not the view, the prevalent view within um, you know, uh, the 12 Shi'i tradition. It's that he's hidden um, meaning his personality is not recognized. We don't know who he is, but he lives on the earth. He continues to live for 1,200 years. You know, this is kind of a miracle as, as God's appointee. God has allowed him this long, extensive life and that he will reappear, meaning he will become manifest before the end of times. Mm -hmm. And according to Shi'i tradition, actually Jesus will follow in his footsteps. He will, he will lead Jesus in prayer and sort of they will work together. Jesus will kind of follow him and together they'll bring about, um, you know, peace and justice and, and so on in, in, uh, in I, the end of time. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, a, that's an excellent sort of uh, overview. Um, and, and just to kind of reinforce what you mentioned, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Sunni tradition, which is, uh, you're right. I mean, when it comes to the Mahdi, uh, Ali Salam, like within the Sunni tradition, he's almost entire. well, not almost, he is entirely an eschatological figure. Uh, that is to say someone who comes towards the end times. Um, and uh, the traditions and really what is really known about him is kind of, is very ambiguous. So it's kind of wrapped in, um, and, and that's not just limited to the Mahdi. One could make that assessment about a lot of the sort of end times uh, traditions which that they're kind of wrapped up in, that they're wrapped in this sort of cloak of ambiguity. And, you know, even in some cases, authenticity is often questioned with regards to how authentic or how strong those, uh, uh, those traditions are from a, from, again, this is, I, I'm, I'm talking and I'm speaking entirely from a Sunni perspective. Um, and so again, to what your point was that, you know, the, uh, the, the major shift being that within the Shi tradition, um, he was already born and he went into this sort of occultation, uh, this Raiba uh, period, and that will last until he, until he emerges again towards the end times. But, and he, but is just a quick question. Was is he, was he uh, in that father son uh, line? Yes. And then yes. historically yes. speaking, there was a disappearance of some sort and then a reappearance and then a, another disappearance. Is that correct? So, so your first question, yes, he is the son of the 11th Imam who is known as Al-Hassan Al-Askari. So he is Muhammad Ibn Al-Hassan. Uh, so he is from that line. Uh, and, and second, there was a disappearance when he was at the age of five. So in the year 260, he was born in 255 at the year 260. And I'll come to why. Um, uh, and then there was no reappearance. The, initially, the Shi'i community thought of the occultation as being a minor, a, a temporary occultation. Um, uh, and it was during this time, which lasted about 70 years, that uh, the leadership of the Shi'i community continued with these four representatives, Sufara, of, of the Imam. It was considered that only they had direct access to the imam and they would sort of act as the envoys or the representatives of the imam to the masses. And so it was the, with the death of the fourth of these uh, sort of representatives uh, that, you know, Shia tradition holds that the imam actually wrote to the fourth representative and he told him, do not um, appoint anyone after you because my occultation will continue indefinitely. And so then Shia tradition holds that at that point, with the death of the fourth sort of representative of the 12th Imam, the, the period of the minor occultation ended um, and the period of the major occultation began, which was indefinite. So there was no reappearance. It was just the difference was that there would be no more direct access to the Imam, even through or, or indirect access, even through, you know, uh, his appointed representatives. Um, now, later on, the scholars would sort of look at um, their role as the indirect, if you will, representatives of the imam. We, and then we come into the sort yeah. of contemporary period with, with some of the implications of that. But, but you know, those were just to, to answer those two of, uh, of your yeah, questions. I, I, yeah, I think 
just for the sake of time, again, we're going to have to like avoid getting into a lot of the modern sort of modern like state of Iran, uh, the Wilayat al faqih and, and those type of issues we'll have to say for another conversation. Um, so I, I appreciate you kind of navigating us there. Um, quick, I, a quick question I had, though, is uh, as a follow up to Omar's question, which is, does this does the imam the twelfth imam who is in Ghaiba, does he communicate at all with anyone in a position of leadership um you know within Shiism? So most scholars would not recognize that as 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 happening um okay not that it was not that it's impossible they don't consider it impossible it's possible that the imam would and you would actually have over the course of uh, of of history. Um, some claim uh, that some scholars, especially those who were very pious, very devout, that they had some sort of communication after the fact, right? They did not recognize that this was the imam at the time. After the fact, they kind of recognized, oh, this was the imam. So you do have those, and there's been a lot of studies about the history of of those claims and, and, and those events. Um, but in theory... Um, the imam no longer communicates with with the masses uh, 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 directly. And now, I would uh, argue. Just, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say. Ahead, I would sorry. argue. I would argue that that's not dissimilar from, um, you know, Sunni tradition with regards to not only dreams of the prophet or the prophet appearing in one's dream and telling a person to pursue this or not pursue this and so on, um, but also uh, saintly figures appearing. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani and many of the disciples of uh, Sayyidina uh, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani claim to have seen him in a dream and, and, and so on. And there's clarity provided. So not dissimilar from what Sunnis recognize as something, uh, especially found in the Sufi tradition again. Sure, sure. Excellent. And, and, and another point that I wanted to make, I kind of wanted to connect this belief in the 12th Imam uh, and sort of. The, the whole idea of occultation. So mm -hmm. again, when you come Thank to you. the justification, you, when you come to the justification, uh, we have to remember uh, Shia tradition holds the imam to be sort of the divine guide, um, the, the one who continues the message of the prophet and, 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 and guides the community and so on and so forth. And so um, Shia tradition would develop this idea of there always having to be a divine guide on earth. There can never be a moment on earth where there is not a divine guide. And so this kind of helps explain the, because there is no revelation after that of Muhammad, that's the final revelation. And you have these series of imams, uh, you know, the 11th imam dies, the 12th imam is born according to Shi'i tradition. There must remain until the end of time, a divine guide. And so uh, that is the role of the 12th Imam, to continue as the divine guide until the end of time. It, there, there cannot be an interrupted sort of chain. You, can, you have to have an un, uninterrupted chain of divine guides all the way until the end of time. Um, and then the other idea related to the occultation is um, we have to kind of go back to, again, you know, you have the Umayyads earlier. You have the Umayyads. Um, uh, uh, and so the, you know, the third Imam al Hussein, he's killed, uh, uh, under the rule of Yazid. Uh, you, then you have the fourth Imam, the fifth Imam, Muhammad al Baqir. At the time of the sixth Imam, Ja'far al Sadiq, uh, who was, by the way, living at the time of, you know, he's a con contemporary of Abu Hanifa. Um, uh, you know, uh, Malik also uh, sort of relates some traditions in Medina. He was in Medina and Malik relates some, uh, traditions. Uh, from, uh, you know, Ja'far, uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq. At that time, of course, you have the shift, the Umayyads fall, the Abbasids come to power. Um, Shia tradition would hold those regimes to be highly oppressive of the Ahlul Bayt. Uh, in fact, some Shia scholars, not all, but some of them would insist that all of the Imams, from the 1st to the 11th, they were all killed. None of them died a natural death. They mm -hmm. were either killed by the sword or they were poisoned. Mm -hmm. um, and so this occurred under sort of the, the direct or the indirect influence of the Umayyad and the Abbasid caliphs. Uh, and so the situation, according to the sort of uh, the Shia understanding, is that the situation progressively came, became worse. In fact, some consider the, uh, the Abbasid dynasty to have been worse than the Umayyad dynasty because the Abbasids, as you'll recall, 
In fact, they claim the saint from Abbas, who is the uncle of the prophet. And, you know, historical sources say that they, they appeared on the stage uh, under the slogan of bringing back power to the family of the prophet. That's right. You know, Shia tradition would hold that they betrayed them. Once they took power, they betrayed the, the, the Talibis or the, the Alawis, the, the descendants of Ali um, uh, and Abu Talib. And, you know, they oppressed them and they killed them and they killed mm. their followers. So progressively, Shia tradition holds uh, the sort of history to have uh, become progressively worse for the imams and their followers to the point where by the time of the um, the ninth, the tenth, the eleventh imams, you have a shift. They're now in Samawa. Samawa was a garrison town. The Abbasids had taken as their capital for some time, and they were under the close watch of uh, the Abbasid caliphs. Um, uh, and so, this kind of uh, moment of fear, uh, of of continued repression of the the imams and the Shia, um, uh, uh, allowed or called for, if you will, the disappearance of the 12th imam, mm-hmm. uh, the occultation of the 12th imam, so that he would be safeguarded, and so that he would be protected from, from murder, from death, and to continue sort of in his, his mission as the final, uh, uh, and the, the, the last divine guide until the end of time. So that's kind of how we understand, yeah. you know, this, this chain of imams, right. and the justifications for, you know, their status, and then also, um, you know, even the occultation of the 12th imam. Conversely, I, I just want to quickly, and again, I, and I really appreciate that. I, well, one, I want to go back to something we, 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 we touched on, but I felt like we, we kind of left it. And I don't want to do that because if we have any listeners who either would want to know about that or even belong to uh, some of those minority uh, you know, minority uh, 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 communities within Shiism, um, we talked about the Ismailis who, uh, again, they, they depart ways from the... Uh, the Ithna Ashari, the Twelvers, um, after the seventh Imam, or at the point of the seventh Imam, uh, that's the Ismaili community, and the Ismaili community is probably most commonly um, manifested in today in the modern time as modern times as either the Al Khani community uh, or the uh, Dawudi Bohra community, which is again very, very small community that's limited almost entirely to uh, Bombay, Mumbai, India. But certainly commu- you, you do have both of these communities enjoy, I would say, a relatively large um, uh, diaspora community here in the West, certainly the al Khani community and the Bohra community. Um, the other point I wanted to make is about the Zaydis. So the Zaydis, as you mentioned, Imam Hadi, um, they kind of depart ways with the fifth Imam. Um, and they're a very, very small minority within Shiism, and they're found predominantly in the Yemen. Um, can we disp- kind of dispense it or, or kind of leave it there? And, and, and for those who are more interested, I'm sure they can get, you know, there's literature out there that, 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 that uh, they can get to. I don't know if you wanted to make any other points about that. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, there's just so much to discuss that I know, I know, because I do justice to these communities. I would definitely, I would definitely recommend those who are interested, definitely read Najm Haider's work. He's written on the origins of the Shia, and he's written a a book, you know, Introduction to Shiism, and he talks about all of these issues. Particularly, he looks at these three groups and the way that they view the imama. Uh, the way that they view the role of the imam, uh, and he looks over, you know, sort of their development over history. So there's a lot of literature, great literature out there. Um, I just don't want to do an injustice to no, no, I, by just, you know, picking a couple of things and saying, you know, this is what they're about. I think that you said it pretty well. You gave a, a pretty good um, overview. You know, the Aga Khanis, their line, yeah. Yeah, the, the Aga Khanis, their line of imams actually continue. They actually believe in the living imam, who's the 49th imam, the Aga Khan. Um, uh, you know, they, you know, trace back, if you go back to the early, the, some of the earliest, um, uh, Ismaili communities, they were actually the founders of the Fatimid dynasty, um, which ruled for some time, which actually Al-Azhar, uh, the preeminent Sunni institution of learning was founded by the Fatimids who were Ismaili Shi'is, uh, before it was taken over, of course, um, uh, at the end of their rule with uh, Falah al-Din. And so, um, you know, and then, and then uh, the, the Yemenis, um, they, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Zaydis, I'm, I'm sorry, who, who predominantly live in, in Yemen now, um, their main kind of idea of the imam 
was that the imam uh, uh, has to be someone who stands up and who rises. And so uh, their focus would not be on the knowledge of the imam as the 12 or Shi'i would, would focus on the imam having to be the most knowledgeable um, uh, of, of his time. Um, but they would, the Zaydis would focus on the imam who is able to rise up. Uh, and so, you know, you have certain imams who were not necessarily the most knowledgeable. They may have even studied with other more knowledgeable theologians, but were considered imams because they actually took up arms uh, and they uh, uh, and they stood up. And in fact, the Zaydis, you know, the, their name, they take their name from Zayd, who is uh, uh, the, the, the son, uh, the grandson of Hussein, uh, Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein, who stood up. There was the, the failed sort of revolt uh, or, or rising up of Zayd. Um, he was he was also massacred. He was also killed. Uh, and so, you know, but but beyond that, beyond that, you know, I, I would definitely encourage our listeners to go back to literature and to and, and to read uh, more community. Yeah, no, I appreciate, it. and and like again, I think the Zaydis, like the Houthis, are, are right in in Yemen. But um, um, yeah, I, I think uh, Professor Najem Haider's name has come up uh, a couple of times now, so it's it's almost like a precursor to trying to get him to appear on the show, inshallah. So you know, uh, God willing, we can make that happen because you mentioned him as well as David. So um, anyway, um, I want to also, and, and I, I really appreciate you mentioning the Fatimids. Because I w- I, that was where I was going to kind of take the conversation, which is with regards to the Fatimids and the, Suf- the Safavid dynasties in particular. And as me and Omar are both Hyderabadis from India, um, even the even the uh, Qutb Shahi dynasty uh, of 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 the of the Deccan state is a Shi'i dynasty. So, uh, how does history kind of then? Like, cause we had this whole conversation about vindication and history and so on. Like, how does Shia history viewed like these dynasty do, do dynasties? Is there a tendency to romanticize them? Is there a tendency to see them as being the quote unquote golden era of Islam? You know, kind of how Muslims, like how, how Sunnis look at say, you know, Muslim Spain, right. As kind of representing this golden period, golden age period. Um, you know, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I can say that, you know, you have sort of a, a romanticization of, of these these dynasties. I mean, look, for instance, um, you know, the, the, again, if you're looking at this from a 12 or Shi'i perspective, um, you know, the Fatimids were Ismailis, you know, and That's so right. they had sort of, you know, they had left. They had not continued with, um, you know, the line of the, the sort of the, the valid imams, if you will. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely that. Now, does this mean that they discounted all of the developments that occurred, even the intellectual developments, the theological developments, the legal developments? Not necessarily. Um, uh, uh, you know, Al-Qadi Nu'man is, is a major scholar uh, in the Shi'i tradition, fourth century. He, uh, you know, he belongs to the Ismaili tradition, but he's also highly praised even in 12 or Shi'i scholarly circles, you know, they refer to some of his works and so on and so forth. Um, but, but, but what I would say is that, you know, uh, you know, Shi'i history would recognize that there were periods where uh, Shi'ism was able to flourish. Um, so one would be what is known as the Shi'i century. This was when the Buyids took over, um, uh, you know, this is uh, again in the, you know, fourth, uh, fourth century uh, the Buyids who came from the Caspian region. Um, there's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of controversy about, um, you know, their origins and, and, and sort of what kind of Shi'is were they? Were they Zaydis? Were they Twelvers? But, you know, there's, there's so, sort of all of this discussion. Uh, but what is known is that when they actually took over, uh, in particular Baghdad, which had a large Shi'i community, uh, think, you know, the Shi'i communities flourished in those areas. Um, and it's referred to as sort of the Shi'i century, uh, because, you know, Twelver Shi'ism, for instance, was flourishing in Baghdad. Uh, you know, the Fatimids were flourishing in Egypt and, uh, uh, and in that region. Um, and that's really where you have some of the greatest Twelver Shi'i scholars. Uh, you know, a Sheikh al-Mufid, a Sharif al-Murtaba, a Sheikh al-Tusi. These guys are sort of the, the major, uh, the, 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 the great scholars of the Twelver Shi'i tradition, the earliest, who, who we have access to their sources. Um, they flourished in that period. This was right before, you know, the Seljuks came. And so, 
um, you know, they'll, uh, you know, uh, a Shi'i tradition would look at that period and, 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 and recognize that as a period of communal and intellectual and religious flourishing. Um, but I don't know if, if, if it would look at all of the different, uh, sort of, uh, uh, the dynasties, uh, that would come and, and vindicate them. Yes, there would be, for instance, when you come to the Safavids, uh, you had uh, the Safavids announcing 12 Shi'ism as the state religion. Uh, of course, this, uh, uh, you know, this was, was a big deal for 12 Shi'ism, um, in terms of just promoting, you, you know, uh, religious doctrine and, 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 and ritual and practice and, and sort of a sense of quote unquote greater freedom. Um, but there were many scholars who, uh, uh, looked unfavorably upon the Safavid, you know, uh, uh, kings or sultans and, 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 um, you know, some of them worked, uh, closely with them. Some of them rejected. So you have, and, and you have that trend also within, oh, you know, Sunnism sure. as well. And so, sure. you know, you had a diversity of views, I think. Um, but yeah, they would definitely recognize that there were periods where, you know, the Shiite community yeah. flourished. Right. So the history is definitely vast and uh, a lot a lot to be explored um, as a follow-up. But just kind of closing on on the theology aspect of it, you really you really did a good job explaining the 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 um, the 12 imams and, and the Mahdi concept. Are there any other key differences between um, uh, Shiism and and Sunnism in terms of theology? Is that the main one, or is there anything other, ma- anything major? Like, are there any major differences? Yeah. So, so the imamat obviously uh, is at the core of of Shi'i belief. Um, the other sort of theological um, uh, issue that is important is the uh, uh, Shi'ism would develop like Mu'tazilism. Uh, Twelver Shi'ism would develop this sort of focus on divine justice, al-adl ilahi. Now, you know, I don't want to get too detailed into the history of the theological development. Yeah, theological I could just school. see that being a huge yeah, yeah, that, conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, but what they would just focus Just hearing on, you say Mu'tazila and Adil, yeah. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is like 10 yeah. episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, they would actually focus on, so they would basically, the 12 Shi'i tradition would recognize five usul Um uh, and the usul din are the principles of belief. This is what they would recognize. They would distinguish between usul din and furu' din The usul din they would categorize as being objects of faith, objects of belief. Number one, of course, is tawheed. Number two is divine justice, al-adl. Number three is the prophethood and nubuwa. Number four is imama, belief in the imams. And number five is the hereafter, al-ma'ad. Now, they would... Uh, 12 Shi'i tradition would hold that those who believe in the first, um, meaning uh, 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 the oneness of God, Tawheed, uh, in uh, Al-Nubuwa, prophethood, and in Al-Ma'ad, hereafter, are Muslims. That's what you need to believe in to be a Muslim. You believe in one God, Muhammad is his messenger, and you believe in, in uh, you know, the hereafter. They would mention uh, or consider the fourth and fifth, which is divine justice, and the imama as being particular to Shi'i belief. And so they would distinguish this between being a Muslim and being a mu'min. You know, if you're a Muslim, you have, you hold these beliefs, but if you're a mu'min, which is a level higher, you believe in divine justice as a theological concept and also uh, at the imama. So that, that, those are, um, sort of the main kind of points. Now within those, you have certain differences. Um, uh, 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 minor differences, you know, things that the majority of Sunni tradition would accept as being part of Sunni belief, the Shi'is would uh, reject. So, uh, for example, um, uh, you know, the, the possibility of seeing God, Ru'yatullah, right? There's the, a huge debate as to whether it's possible in the hereafter, not in the life, in the hereafter, to see the God. Beatific, the so-called beatific the, vision of God. The yeah. beatific vision. Ahsent, excellent. Um, you know, Shi'i tradition would maintain that this is impossible. Uh-huh. Even in the hereafter. It cannot be, it, 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 that cannot be uh, done. Okay. Um, Sunni tradition would maintain, of course, a large part that, that this is possible. Again, these are interpretations. But even then, right? I mean, I would just yeah, say, yeah. like, even then it gets real, like, complicated. Like, was is there a veil between, right? The, the hijab, like, is there a veil between uh, that uh, beatific uh, vision uh, and the naked eye? So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you the know, spiritual eye. Sorry, spiritual eye. 
the nuances of theology. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, these little right. uh, questions, of course, there'd be uh, differences, but, but, you know, these are sort of the major points. And then they would, the, the other category is the, sort of the, the acts of worship. And this is where they would put in prayer, fasting, hajj, zakat, homes, you know, al-amr bil-ma'roof, al-nahi al munkar all of these things that are familiar to the Sunni tradition, but as acts of worship. And so they would distinguish between beliefs and acts of worship. Um, and in those, in those acts of worship, you have slight differences. Um, Before uh, we get into those differences, if you don't mind, I want to, uh, because I think that there's a way we can do this um, in, the, in the time that we have remaining. And again, we've, I know we're going down as this being the longest episode ever recorded uh, of, <laughs> on the podcast, but that's fine. I know I welcome it. I, if, if, if there ever were an episode that I'd want to be for it to be the longest, it'd be this one. So um, anyway, is, is to maybe kind of talk about the praxi element um, uh, by way of sort of saying, well, these are some of the misconceptions that Sunnis have. Uh, with regards to Shiism. And then conversely, you can maybe expose us to certain misconceptions, if you will, or stereotypes that Shias hold with regards to Sunni practice. Sure. And But really quickly, before I, I, I leave, I, I do want to kind of, Omar alluded to this very early on, um, and, and Omar and I are cousins, by the way, and so there's certainly a family link here. Um, but Omar mentioned something that his grandmother did and, and, you know, and I spent the weekend, I was talking to my mom, I was talking to my mother, who's Omar's aunt. So we're, that's how we're related. Um, and you know, she was telling us that she was telling me, sorry, she was telling me that in our, in our maternal side, so a maternal side that me and Omar both share, um, you know, it was very commonplace for our family members to do practices, uh, especially in the months of, uh, in the month of Muharram, the first nine nights of Muharram, like vis-a-vis -vis, like attending Majalis and so on. Like I be like, uh, Omar, you may not even have heard some of these. I heard these for the first time, but like our maternal great grandmother, you know, she would wear black in the first 10 days, nine days of Muharram. She would attend as many Majalis as possible in Hyderabad. Um, and when we talk about even Hyderabad history, like sort of the glory age of Hyderabad is considered under the seventh like Nizam who is uh, Usman Ali Khan. And there's even accounts where not only was he enamored with Shi Shiism, but he may, he may have actually embraced Shiism. Um, and what we do know as a fact is that uh, many of the sort of uh, areas of worship, uh, in, including Azahana Zahra, which is named after his mother, which is this really huge Shia, uh, uh, Shi like majlis site in Hyderabad, that was started by the Nizam, like the seventh Nizam. And so the kind of the, the, the confluence we see, especially among Hyderabadis um, with regards to Shias, Shias and Sunnis, um, is something that I, I can, I sort of, you know, take pride in as just sort of belonging to that tradition, because, you know, we do see these areas where, um, you know, whether it was because of proximity or because of just, because of, 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 of feeling that sense of, uh, love and fidelity and devotion to Ahl al-Bayt that, that many Sunnis would, would kind of, you know, um, to, would, would engage in practices that would quote unquote be associated as being Shi practices. So I just wanted to kind of point that out um, just because Umar and I are related. And so it'd be kind of fun to talk about a family, family anecdote. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, and and um, the funny thing is, I was actually referring to my paternal grandmother. No, I know you were. My daughter exactly. who lived with us, right? Right, right. Yeah, and she was, she was, the funny, just side note, she I, she was very, um, I guess you could say stoic. She, she, would, she wasn't somebody who cried a lot, but she would tell me she would go to Majlis and cry, right? Yeah. So she'd be oh, part yeah. of that ex experience that... Um, I thought that was really interesting as somebody who lived with her, but never saw her, never really saw her cry that often when she'd said that's that. right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I don't want to turn this into a, <laughs> like a family oral history, uh, Imam Hadi, but I just wanted to share that with you. I mean, in case, you know, those stories mean anything, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, th I, I really appreciate you sharing that because, you know, again, um, you know, you have in these various parts of, of what we call the Muslim world and, and yeah. these different societies where um, for a long time, these people who, you know, they may have identified as Sunni or Shi'i, but at the end, they lived together and they kind of participated in many of these rituals and many of these gatherings, especially in the case of, you know, Imam Hussein, the morning of Imam Hussein. I mean, look, 
even if you look at Egypt, right? You, you mentioned this, I think, earlier on. There's, there's kind of discussion about, um, you know, where the head of Imam Hussein is located, oh, yeah. right? Um, and so there's this whole kind of discussion about whether it's in Karbala with the body, whether it's um, in Egypt, you know, in, in, in uh, Cairo. Uh, there's Hussein. The, yeah. Al, Al Hussein, exactly. And right across have, the street fact, from Al Azhar. Yeah, built there you by go. the and you, ha- you have the mosque there, um, and, and there's sort of a shrine, a mausoleum, if you will. And until this day, I mean, depending on the political circumstances, but until this day, no, you I mean, have I was there the, during the Mubarak reign, and yeah, it was yeah. full fledged. Every Jama'ah I would go there. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And, and, and people go there and they begin to recite poetry and they engage in all of these different rituals and the visitation of this, uh, you know, this shrine, this mausoleum. So, and, and, you know, and so, so in these different areas, of course, you have these communities coming together and they, right. and they you know, and so it's not, it's not, yeah, it, we, we shouldn't think of this as, as these are mutually exclusive, absolutely at all times. You know, Sunnis will never participate in some of these gatherings. Shi'is will ne- never participate in, you know, quote unquote Sunni gatherings and so on and so forth. Um, you know, that, 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 that is, um, you know, that's not just how sure. it happens everywhere. Um, yeah. So as I said, I, you know, and I appreciate those words. Thank you. And, and, and hopefully we'll, we can kind of conclude on some of those remarks as well. But to kind of navigate us through, you know, the areas of practice, a Shi practice. And as I said, to maybe kind of frame it in a way that where listeners who may have either preconceived notions or uh, stereotypes or, like I said, misconceptions about Shiism can have them flushed out, if you don't mind. Um, so to kind of begin with, um, with regards to Jafari jurisprudence right um because uh, you know when, like I, I would submit that with regards to sunni perception or sunni's view, sunni views of the 12 imams perhaps no other figure is as lauded and shared and and exalted in the sunni tradition uh, among those 12 as jafar al-sadiq um and like you alluded to and mentioned um the sort of uh not only the, the, the kind of historical, pro- the, geo, the geo, uh, geopolitical proximity of these figures, like Imam Malik and Jafar al-Sadiq and Imam Abu Hanifa, but these three schools in particular, I think, um, are not just, me- we're not just mentioning them uh, by happenstance. I mean, there's a lot of confluence within these three schools in particular. Um, so if you could maybe talk a little bit about that, like, because like the Jafari school and its relationship to specifically the Maliki school among Sunnis and the Hanafi schools. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So for the, the first thing that I would say, um, kind of the biggest misconception that I think a lot of us have, um, you know, those who identify as Sunni or Shi'i, um, is that uh, there are huge differences in acts of worship or rituals between the Sunnis and Shi'is. I would actually argue that in some cases there are bigger differences between the four Sunni uh, schools of law than there are between some of them and the Shi'i or what we call the Jafari school of, uh, of law. Okay, there are some things, you know, the Malikis uh, are, are very close to the Jafaris on some issues, on other, th- on other sh- issues. The, the Jafaris are closer to the, the, the Hanafis and so on and so forth. So that's the biggest misconception. The, the details, I think, of, of these acts of worship, um, these differences, they're there between all of the different schools. Um, and some of them are, are, are ma- minor. I would say the vast majority of, of them are, are minor differences when it comes to uh, law. Now, a point about the term Jafari school of thought. Now, um, the, the, you know, we said, of course, the 12 Rashi'is, theologically, they believe in 12 Imams. Um, often, the legal uh, school of thought, the legal madhab, is termed the Ja'fari, not because um, none of the other Imams participated. In fact, um, you know, the, 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 the Shi'is would hold as authoritative all of the, the pronouncements, the sunnah of the imams, if you will, as an extension to the sunnah of the prophet. So the sunnah of the prophet and that of the imams as part of the legal school. The reason why the focus is on Jafar al-Sadiq is because, um, uh, because during his time, uh, again, we said the, the Umayyads were falling, the Abbasids were coming to power, there was sort of uh, political uh, 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 tension and strife. This kind of opened up the room 
for Jafar al-Sadiq and his father, Muhammad al-Baqir, the fifth imam and the sixth imam, to teach. And they were based in Medina. And so they had a little bit of room, greater room, to kind of teach. And, uh, and, and, and the vast majority of the reports within the Shi'i tradition go back to the sixth imam. And this is why, and, and, and part of that is also the legal reports, the reports that have sort of legal connotations to them. Um, and this is why the school is called Ja'fari. So it's not, you know, Ja'fa only because only Ja'far al-Sadiq himself is the founder of the school. All of the imams sort of uh, uh, contribute to it, but it's because of uh, um, sort of that, uh, the, um, the number of reports that go back to uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq yeah. uh, and, and their uh, prominence sort of in the um, uh, 12 or Shi'i legal tradition. Yeah, um, and again, you see similarities yeah. to 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 the Sunni schools because where we really see, where, like even when we talk about these four madhabs within Sunni Islam, I mean these were the these were the ones that proliferated. There were dozens of others that either because of the number of followers or the number of adherents or m- multiple reasons just eventually died out. But you know these were the four sort of prevailing schools just by numbers in some cases or by you know uh like the state kind of you know taking or subsuming that school as its official school is the only reason you see the pro- the proliferation yeah and 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 i would add uh, you know point to that i think is that even when we talk about you know these four sunni schools it's true that they have eponyms you know malik uh, uh, abu hanifa shafi'i and ahmed ibn hanbal but the school obviously was made up of these figures and their followers and subsequent generations and so it was not just one figure who kind of yeah. uh, put out the the entire doctrine of of these schools they developed uh, over the course of of you know several generations yeah. and with many that, many yeah that if the hanafi school just by sheer volume of numbers and followers uh very little can be actually attributed directly to imam abu hanifa because much of his writings and his there, there's not much extant work of imam abu hanifa it's really his two uh primary students yusuf and muhammad imam muhammad and imam yusuf yeah absolutely um and so yeah coming back to let's take a, a few examples yeah, of, of sort of Issues. So one, I would say the fir- very first is regarding, uh, you know, the five daily prayers. Thank you. Um, I was you just know, about to go there. Yeah, the five daily prayers, the big misconception I think that a lot a lot of people have is that the Shia either don't pray or pray, you pray. know, three times, three, three times, times a day. day <laughs> or three prayers, three prayers a day. Now, sorry, yeah. I mean, that's absolutely uh, false. Um, you know, there they are five daily prayers. The difference is that the Shia uh, they combine uh, Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. They combine those times. So for them, you have uh, uh, sort of the the choice of praying Asr immediately after you finish praying Dhuhr and praying Isha immediately after you finish praying Maghrib or splitting them up and, and doing them at their appointed you know, uh, time. You have the choice of doing that. And, 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 you know, Shi'i scholars will point to, even in the Sunni tradition, there are reports where the Prophet, um, you know, he gave that choice uh, and he would combine prayers when he was not in war, when he was not, you know, traveling, when he was not just under normal circumstances. So that's number one. Um, and in fact, uh, what's interesting is that, it, it, you know, the Shi'i jurists have maintained that it, there is greater merit and greater reward to separating the prayers. Uh, and praying them at their specific times, then to joining them. But, you know, um, for convenience sake, I would say the vast majority, virtually all, uh, you know, uh, uh, Shia who observe prayer probably join Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Aisha. It just makes life so much easier um, when, you, when, you, when you get those prayers done. So that's, that's one misconception. Um, there are minor details in the prayer itself Thank of you. things that are recited. But the number of units, the number of rakahs is the same, exactly the same. There's no difference. There's no addition. There's no subtraction. Um, uh, uh, you know, some minor points of, 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 of differences in what is recited. Otherwise, it, you know, if you were to look at a Shi'i and a Sunni pray, if you were to hear them pray, uh, many of the things that they recite in prayer are the same. Now, uh, an explicit sort of a very evident difference is in terms of where the hands are placed in prayers. So many Sunnis, when they pray, when they're standing in prayer, they place their, their hands on their chest, right? 
um, one on top of the other. This is in the standing position. Uh, this is known in Arabic as a takatuf. And, and so uh, the Shia, in fact, they pray with their hands down. Um, and, um, you know, this is something they have in common with the Maliki school. Yeah. A lot of students are not aware of this. But yeah. the Malikis have the option of playing with their hands up or down. And according to their scholars, uh, the Maliki scholars, it's preferred to pray with their hands down. Um, and so, you know, just a, an anecdote, you know, Professor Jackson has brought this up a few times. I, I don't know if you've heard him, Parviz, but uh, others have, you know. I, mean, I, about I, how, I, I had a Jacksonian story, too, that I was going to reference. So let's see if it's the same one. <laughs> yeah. So I, he, he, with, with regards you know, when, to uh, like the Malikis. Yeah. 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 When he explains, when he explains, um, you know, sort of prayer and he talks about these differences, and how a lot of people kind of don't recognize the diversity within even Sunni Islam. Uh, he gives this example of, of, you know, him, you know, standing in a Sunni mosque, praying with his hands down, and people are looking at him funny, thinking <laughs> that he's a Shi'i and asking yeah. him if he's, <laughs> if he's a Shi'i, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, this, you know, this stuff happens, um, uh, oh, yeah. you know, uh, you know, these are some of the similarities and differences. Yeah. But yeah, as far as the prayer is concerned, I mean, you know, very, very minor differences uh, in the way that the prayer is recited. Yeah, by way of personal anecdote, um, I, I remember the first time I walked into a uh, uh, a, a, a Shi like a Shia mosque in in Dearborn. Actually, in fact, it was your uncle's, but this was the old location. So this was before the Islamic Center of America has that really really big one uh, on Dearborn Avenue. This was when they were, uh, or it was sorry, Michigan Avenue, maybe not, or it was Michigan or Ford, Ford Avenue. Ford. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Ford Avenue. Uh, this is when they had, still had that very small, like much smaller center. Um, I think off of Schaefer or something. Um, but, but, but anyway, um, I, I mentioned all that because I remember I was, I had left my class at Wayne state. I was going home and it was getting late for Maghrib and I just pulled into a mosque. It was just any mosque I could find. I was still pretty, relatively new to Dearborn and I happened to find Islamic center of America. Yeah. Hey, hey, this name sounds perfect. Islamic center of America. Can't, can't get any more, uh, you know, <laughs> apple pie than that. Um, and it was South of Maghrib and, I have to be honest. I mean, initially I was utterly lost. Like I did not know when I joined, what Shuraka I was because there, yes, you're right. There are a lot of uh, like some of the ritual, like, like the differences in the ritual prayer with regards to what is recited out loud, what is recited to one, you know, privately. Uh, I think that's really the kind of confusion for someone who may be coming from a Sunni perspective um, and just joining the Jama'ah. And not knowing, you know, not knowing where they are. Um, I thought what you were going to talk about with regards to prayer specifically is also uh, praying on uh, natural earth. Uh, yes. Is that now? Now, now again, one of the big misconceptions, or, or, or uh, yeah, like misconceptions around that is that that is specifically the soil from Karbala. Um, and, and so maybe kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, that, that's a great reminder. I, I appreciate that you reminded me. Um, yeah. So when it comes to prostration, uh, what the, the, the jurists have kind of, um, suggested is that it is mandatory to prostrate upon, uh, something that is natural, uh, that is, you know, technically the, the sort of the condition is that is not eaten nor is worn. Um, and so, uh, you know, it could be dust, uh, it could be uh, uh, clay, it could be rock, it could be a leaf, it could be wood, anything that is not, not worn, nor is eaten. Um, and, and the prostration must occur on that. Now, you know, the ju justification for this is that um, the Prophet used to prostrate on the, on the dirt uh, in the Masjid, Masjid al Madina, uh, the Prophet's mosque. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, he, the prophet says, masjidan wa tahura. the earth is, has been made a place of, 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 of prostration and a place of purity for me. So there, that's the justification for it. Um, yeah. now, um, now, in fact, and, and Omar studied the Maliki school, I think a while back, but I mean, like, I think that's actually the preferred opinion, even in the Maliki school to pray on, on, on something natural. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so. Uh, what happens is that you have um, around, um, you know, Hussein, the story of Hussein is one in the Shia tradition that doesn't start like with, um, uh, with Karbala. I mean, you have within the tradition sort of this, this whole cosmological 
um, uh, interpretation um, of, of uh, you know, the, the, the imams or the heirs of the prophets, of all of the prophets. So you have this uninterrupted line, if you, if you recall, I, I mentioned this, an uninterrupted line of divine guides beginning from Adam all the way to Mahdi, uh, the Mahdi. And so, um, you know, so, so this event was so momentous in the Shi'i tradition uh, that, um, you know, even the, the ancient prophets, they, they knew about it. Yes, they, right. they knew that it was going to happen. Some traditions say they even, you know, some of them passed through the land of Karbala. And, and so Karbala as, as a place, as, you know, what we what in religious studies call sacred geography, um, you know, it, 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 it really holds this, in, in the Shi'i uh, view, it's not just any place. It yeah. is like the most sacred and it actually competes, according to the tradition, sometimes it competes even with Mecca, right, in its sacredness. Um, I, I, have, I have an article, hopefully, coming out soon about this, um, uh, you know, sort of the, the place of Karbala in the Shi'i uh, historical and collective memory and in, in sacred geography. And so the, the place of Karbala itself, um, you know, the dust of Karbala acquires uh, this great significance as being the place in which Hussein is martyred. Um, and in fact, even Shi'i tradition holds that even before his death, during the life of the Prophet, the Prophet is sort of sitting. There's a report that says he's sitting. Um, he receives uh, inspiration, you know, revelation from Jibra'id, um, and and he begins to weep. He begins to cry. Uh, his wife, Um Salama, asks him, uh, you know, what's going on? And he says, Jibra'id came to me, and he asked me, Hussein was in his lap. And he asked me, do you love uh, your grandson, Hussein? The Prophet says, of course I love him. Um, and and, and Jibra'id tells him, Gabriel tells him, he's going to be killed by those who claim to be from your community. And so the Prophet begins to weep. And he says that, um, the Prophet says that uh, uh, Gabriel brought forth uh, uh, some sand, dust, from the place of Hussein's martyrdom. Uh, and 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 the, the tradition says that the prophet gives Um Salama this dust, and he tells her, "Keep this dust with you, and once you see this dust turning into blood, you will know that that is when Hussein is killed." And so Shi'i tradition holds that that actually happened. That Um Salama, you know, she receives, uh, 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 she has this dust, and it actually uh, she she becomes aware of. Uh, you know the sanctity of this dust, and 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 it turning uh, into blood after the death of uh, or, or or the martyrdom of of Hussein. So, the dust of Karbala itself acquires significant meaning. So, what some scholars were uh, uh, would hold is that there are traditions by the later imams. In particular, you have Imam Jafar Sadiq, who would um, who would encourage the Shia to visit Hussein uh, and to also. Uh, recognize the significance of the dust of the burial site of Hussein, number one, as being uh, uh, sacred, and so prostration on it would, would lead to greater reward in prayer, uh, but also there would be traditions about it having healing power, that the dust of Karbala, especially that which surrounds the grave, the tomb of Hussein, in fact, even heals. And there's a lot of stories you have even in the contemporary Shi'i period, in popular Shi'i circles, stories of people being cured from various illnesses because they consumed, you know, this dust of Karbala. So, so yes, so you do have within the tradition that the dust of Karbala is important, but not that you have to prostrate on the dust of Karbala. It's just greater in significance and greater in reward, but the, it is mandatory to prostrate on anything that is natural under those conditions that, um, you know, that it's not worn or not eaten. Yeah. No, I really, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. And uh, I, I would just also... Just to add just, a note, sorry, yeah, yeah, Pervis, just to add a, so, so, so you'll find that actually the Shia carry with them. In their mosques, they have clay tablets, and they'll carry them with them, you know, when they travel and whatnot, so, uh, you know, so as to place their, uh, their, their, um, their forehead um, uh, on the dust, you know, on this clay, uh, whenever they, they pray. That's right. Uh, no, th and thank you for that note. Um, I was just going to say, like, I, I think kind of my role in this conversation this whole time has been kind of, you know, bringing in like, you know, the Sunni perspective where I feel it, it's, 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 it's an interesting perspective to offer uh, or, or perhaps a, 
a, a perspective that even most Sunnis aren't aware of, which is like you you'll find that especially among uh, the Sufi tradition uh, within Sunnism, Sunnism, that um, the that that Imam Hassan and Hussein take on a, 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 a metaphysical take on metaphysical dimensions. Um, and I don't want to get into some of it because I mean, but I have heard things from like well reputed sort of, you know, Sufi masters who would talk about the sort of metaphysical reality of Imam Hussein and, and Imam Hassan. So again, what you're talking about, which, which is idea of, of, of the, um, uh, of the supremacy of Ahlul Bayt and the place of Ahlul Bayt and, 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 and specifically Imam Hassan and Hussein. I mean, this is something that, and we talked about this on, on the episode with David, or at least alluded to it, that, you know, among Sunnis, where if you, if you, if you want to talk about where, you know, like juristically speaking, where you have a lot of similarities between the Malikis and the, and the Jafaris or the, or the Hanafis in some insta in instances in the Jafaris, well, I would argue that from a theological perspective, from a metaphysical perspective, uh, there's a lot of areas of confluence among the Sufis and, 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 and the Shi tradition. I just want to kind of throw that out there. Um, if I can kind of navigate you now again, kind of walk you through, um, and this is a real contentious one. So I want to apologize in advance, but because I'm going to kind of, I, I'm going to have you kind of navigate a question that I think may be difficult, which is one of the things that, that one of the, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, or one of the perspectives that Sunnis have with regards to Shiism or Shia in particular is that they not only uh, ho hold some of these companions of the Prophet as being culpable in betraying or in, uh, yeah, in betraying Ali, Sayyidina Ali and Fatima, but they would go in so far as to, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, utter damnation and curses upon some of these companions as a right, as a religious right. Can you clear that up? I mean, as something, as, as I said, as, 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 as an uncomfortable as a conversation as that is, um, could you maybe clarify that and, and, and clear that up for our listeners? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. So uh, we have to come back, uh, first of all, to this notion of, um, sort of the status of a sohba or sahaba companionship. Um, Sunni thought would kind of give um, a sort of automatic um, uh, 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 status of, of, of not uh, criticizing uh, the sahaba uh, because they were sahaba, because they were the companions of, of the prophet. And so you know, they would sort of be, uh, it's not that, you know, uh, that w they were considered inerrant. Um, no, you know, they realized that uh, some erred, but that they were above criticism. You could not criticize sort of their, their acts at all. Just by virtue of them being companions, just by virtue of their companionship, their suhba to the Prophet. Uh, the Shia would not hold this opinion. Um, they would hold that, uh, a suhba, genuine companionship, was when the companions actually, um, uh, you know, they sort of obeyed the prophet. Uh, they 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 did what the the prophet commanded them, which in the Shi'i tradition would be, you know, sort of to hold fast onto the tradition of the Ahl Bayt after him. Um, and so, just by virtue of them being companions, did not necessarily mean that they were above criticism um, and and they would point to sort of the quran uh, as as a source for this understanding or or evaluation if you will of the companion so the quran they, the, the argument that they would make is that the quran um it honors some companions uh, uh, uh it praises uh some companions uh but it also recognizes that there were some who surrounded the Prophet who were hypocrites. Um, you know, the, the Quran says, um, you know, وَمِنْ مَنْ حَوْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مُنَافِقُونَ uh, You know, telling the Prophet, there are some around you from the Bedouins who were munafiqoon, who were hypocrites. Mm -hmm. وَمِنْ mm -hmm. أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَ And from the people of Medina, مَرَدُوا عَلَى النِّفَاقِ They were hard-headed in their, uh, you know, hypocrisy. And then the Quran kind of tells the Prophet, 
um, you know, you know some of them, but you don't know some of them. We know them. God says, you know, some of them, they were revealed to you, and some of them, you don't even know who they were, okay? Um, and then there's sort of uh, some who are criticized for even small acts of disobedience. I'll give you another example. Look at, um, you know, Surah Al-Jumu'ah. This is a chapter of the Quran that we recite often in the, um, you know, the weekly Friday prayer. Um, uh, you know, it is named after Friday, right? The chapter mm-hmm. is called Friday. That's right. Uh, and, and, and in this verse towards the end, you know, the, the believers the, are, are encouraged that when the call to prayer uh, occurs on Friday at noon, uh, that they should rush. Leave all sort of business and, and rush to the worship of God. And then the verse says, after the prayer is uh, finished, then go back to your lives and remember God. And then it says, Right? And when they see, meaning those who are sitting, praying with you, O Prophet, they're, they're sitting there in the mosque, when they see tijara, business, or lahu, something else that sort of preoccupies them. Frivolity, uh, let's they, say. Yeah. They, they, they run towards it. They left you standing alone, right? And then, you know, the Quran says, قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ Tell them, O oh Prophet, that what is with God is better than this business. So, so what some scholars have said is like that, that the Quran itself it dispraises some. It says some were hypocrites. It praises some. It says some were good. They were well intentioned. They did good acts. They, you know, they fought with um, the prophet. They are the, uh, you know, uh, the the front runners among the muhajirin and the ansar and so on and so forth. And some were uh, dispraised for some acts, such as leaving the prophet. You know, who who were these? Who were the people who left the prophet? They were those who were the companions of the prophet. Right? We don't know who they are. They're not indicated. The names of them. Yeah, but right. the point is, the point that is being made is that just by virtue of being a companion of the Prophet does not mean that you are above criticism. And this would be the position that the Shia would take towards the, the, the entirety of the companions. They would praise some, they would honor some for their acts, for their sort of obedience to the Prophet, for all of the things they did, the, sacrificing their lives for the sake of Islam and so on and so forth. And they would hold some to account, those who they saw their actions either went against the Prophet or they betrayed the Prophet and so on and so forth. Now, so this is the first thing that we kind of have to understand, that that the, what Shi'i scholars would argue regarding the uh, uh, companions is that they're not above criticism just by virtue of being companions. Um, this is number one. Now, does this necessarily, um, you know, where does this lead us? Right. If some are criticized, to what extent are they criticized and who has the authority to criticize them? Um, And this is where there would be a lot of differences. This is a a, sort of a contentious issue, even within Shi'i scholars, uh, Uh uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, and among uh, Shi'i scholars. Um, So there were there would be sort of some clear examples. And so in the cases of, you know, the first caliphs. Uh, uh, in the cases of those who would be considered rebels who rose up against Ali and others, there would be clear condem- condemnations of these acts. These were wrong, they were unjustified, um, and some even went to the extent to consider some of these acts as kufr, as a kind of sort of rejection of belief. Um, uh, but then there would be this whole idea, this, this sort of distinction, if you will, between two concepts. One which is uh, which you refer to as sort of damnation, condemnation, which in Arabic is referred to as la'an, right? La'an. And another concept which uh, uh, in Arabic is referred to as sab, which is cursing, which is using sort of foul language um, uh, 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 or labeling someone in a, in a foul way. Right. Now, um, and again, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is a very sensitive topic. Um, but I think that, as I said in the outset, and you mentioned this, we have to kind of be uh, um, willing to have uncomfortable conversations um, so that we can understand and move forward. Most of the Shi'i scholars, they would permit the first, meaning uh, condemning and, and, and sort of damning um, uh, you know, those companions who, in the view of the Shi'a, did wrong acts unjustified acts, but they would prohibit 
um, using foul language. And their justification, their justification for permitting la'an would be that the Qur'an itself constantly brings up this issue of condemnation and damning. Um, and that the Qur'an gives many examples where not only does God say God curses, but there's also examples, you know, for instance, um, the Qur'an says, uh, you know, يَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّعِنُونَ And those who give curse or, 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 or condemn, sorry, not curse, but condemn or damn, they will also condemn them. And so, 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 so again, they point to the Qur'an uh, and they point to sort of the, 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 the prophetic tradition of holding some people to account. And they explain the damnation as essentially being the person asking God to remove God's mercy away from this individual. That's essentially what na'an is, according to the Shi'i tradition. That you are basically asking God in the same way that you would ask God to praise, you know, Muhammad and the household of Muhammad and the believers and the righteous companions to send praise upon them. You also ask God to condemn those who, you know, uh, were not considered righteous or who did wrong or whatnot. And that's essentially, um, you know, the essence of what it means to, to, to do na'an. And this, also, one more point that I think is important to keep in mind is it falls under this rubric of al-wala wal bara uh, mm. associating and disassociating, association and disassociation. That, you know, we are in required as believers from a Shi'i point of view, um, that we are required to associate with God, with the messenger of God, and with those who... Um, uh, continue on the path of God and the messenger of God and to disassociate from those who turn away from the path of God and the messenger of God. And so, right. so, like so from wala, we get wilaya, we get awliya. So th these are, these are saintly figures. And even in, again, uh, just to interject a Sunni note, which is, yeah, to keep the company of the righteous, to keep the, be in the sohba, in the companionship uh, of uh, the awliya. Yeah, um, but but I have to make this note, and this is an important note. No, no, please, please. Again, this is this is a a, a a contentious issue again within even Shi'i circles, and there's some scholars, some jurists have publicly, major Shi'i jurists and scholars have publicly come out, and he have also uh, considered it prohibited to even engage in la'an of the companions of certain figures, uh, uh, and they have done this publicly. Um, because, of course, as you can imagine, I mean, this is uh, a very contentious issue. And in fact, as we speak right now, as we speak in Pakistan, um, many Shi'i preachers and, and uh, scholars and those who have been residing in Muharram are being uh, imprisoned. And some of them are being actually uh, uh, um, uh, sort of punished for... Um, what is alleged, uh, their, their condemnation of the companions, in particular, of course, Yazid and Muawiyah, the Umayyad, yeah. but even maybe some, some of the other companions, um, you know. There's, the, a, whole, there's the, a whole piece that needs to be done about the sort of blasphemy laws of Pakistan, and I'm sure some of this is, is, is within the rubric of, that, of, of these anti-blasphemy laws. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you for making. Thank you for bringing awareness to that issue. I don't think a lot of listeners knew that. Know that. Um, so, if you want to kind of like, yeah. So, thank you for bringing that up as well in terms of kind of presenting the array of positions with regards to uh, you know uh, Shia uh, Shias and uh, their opinion of um, the companions uh, and and how to how to even discuss the some certain companions of the Prophet. Um, anything else that you wanted to say? Because I want to ask you maybe one more question, and then we really need to conclude. I mean, as much as yeah. I would like, 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 like this to be the uh, 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 the uh, um episodes, right? Like the mother of all episodes. Um, I, I know we do have to wrap, uh, and we're already kind of getting close to the three the three hour mark, which is a new uh, a new record for us. Um, do, do I get do I get some sort of plaque <laughs> or recognition or something like that? You totally should, man. You totally should. Um, just for having patience with all my uh, all of our questions, I mean that alone should get you like on some kind of wall uh, of, of of fame. Um, 
last question for me, I promise, which is, um, we, we, you know, uh, one of the other sort of contentious issues, if I would, if I were to pick two that I wanted to discuss, one would be the idea of, 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 of cursing and, and uh, of the companions. And number two would be, um, self-flagellation, right? Uh, and passion plays the motham, like what occurs in the 10 days of Muharram, more specifically in on the 10th, on the day of Ashura. Um, if you could maybe talk about that again in, in very much the same way you just kind of presented us with regards to perhaps the plurality and the various views on this subject within Shi thought, because I think, again, just as a, as a, as a lay person, I, I, I imagine there are multiple positions. Sure. Um, uh, you know, this this uh, issue, again, uh, uh, is one that is contentious. And, and, and one, actually, you know, if you were to, um, uh, so, so, so this is, this is how I would put it. Um, all, uh, again, you know, we're, we're looking at the 12 Rashi'i tradition here. All 12 Rashi'is will agree that uh, commemorating uh, Ashura and commemorating the martyrdom of Imam Hussein is something that has to continue. That, that has to be done. It's part of what it means to be, um, you know, Shi'i, that we commemorate the martyrdom of, of Imam Hussein. Now, this is done in very different ways, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it can start with something, uh, uh, first of all, Majalis, and you brought, you brought this up, uh, uh, Parviz, you, you brought this up, and I think, Omar, you might have also brought this up as well, both of you, about Majalis, right? Um, there are gatherings, that occur in, in the first, you know, nine or 10 days of Muharram until Ashura in some communities over the course of the entire month of Muharram and even the entire month of Safar until the 40th of, of Imam, ah. which is the 20th ah. of Safar. So those yeah. two months are sort of in some communities are months of mourning uh, mm. entirely. Um, and so these gatherings occur, you know, usually what happens is that, um, you know, those who are observing sort of they recall some, some part of the, uh, the, the tragedy of Ashura, uh, many of them, they weep, they cry. Um, some of them, uh, they will um, do matam uh, uh, or, or in Arabic, lotmiya. basically, they beat their chests to a rhythmic, uh, poetic expression. So you have poets who will recite poems about Ashura rhythmically, and the community kind of beats their chest. This varies in terms of of, of, of severity. So you will have some who will just, you know, kind of as, as a symbolic Symbolic. gesture of, of, of mourning, they will kind of beat their chest very lightly. You have others who will, you know, uh, it gets more extreme. Um, uh, and so they, they will, you know, beat their chest even harder. Uh, again, these are, you know, sort of differences in various places and in various times. Um, um, what you will have is some that will kind of go even beyond that. And they will engage in uh, uh, self-flagellation where they might strike, strike their heads or other parts of their bodies with blades or chains or something like that and actually let blood. Um, this is more prominent in some uh, communities uh, uh, in the Muslim world than it is in others. Um, uh, uh, and um, again, uh, this is a contentious issue. Some uh, jurists have permitted this to the extent that it does not endanger the life of the person who's doing it, um, and some have prohibited it. Uh, so this, again, is a juristic uh, sort of um, uh, debate that occurs between the, the, the major uh, jurists and the major mujtahids and the scholars about the permissibility or impermissibility. Of it. Now, if you go on Google, and you Google Ashura, and you Google images, that's all you yeah. All you will see is, you know, people who are, you know, running blood, they're, they're striking themselves and others. That's all you'll see. But, um, you know, if you were to look at, um, you know, uh, in North America, for instance, I can say with, with confidence, and these are, uh, uh, programs and events that I've participated in and I continue to participate all across the country. This does not happen in the vast majority of these, these events. Yes. There's a lecture. There's crying, there's weeping, there's even chest beating. That, that, that's kind of the standard. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, the, the other kinds of self-flagellation do not occur in the vast majority of, of uh, events that partake, at least in, in the case of you know, North America, even in Europe, even in other places. And there are also other expressions. Some, um, again, in, in some of these places and other places, they've decided 
that, for instance, instead of engaging in some of these ritual uh, uh, acts of commemoration and mourning, that they actually give blood uh, in the name of Hussein. You know, on the day of Ashura, they hold blood drives. Um, uh, you know, they, 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 they hold other events, uh, sort of educational events. Sometimes there are uh, processions that go out. So in major cities in LA, in New York, in other cities, you know, even across the Muslim world, you'll have processions. And, you know, again, the way that these processions are observed are very differently depending on the community and, and those uh, participating. So there's a variety of ways in which commemoration of Ashura and Muharram is expressed. And, you know, some of these issues related to self-flagellation, again, it's a contentious issue. And there's debate even within Shi'i circles about um, the permissibility or impermissibility of, of some of yeah. these just again, by 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 virtue of a personal anecdote, um, I, I actually attended one of these processions that take place annually, uh, still to this date in uh, in going back to Hyderabad again, um, which uh, is is perhaps more on the extreme end of what you mentioned, where you actually do have people who engage in uh, very severe forms of self flagellation, um, and there is the letting of blood. Um, uh, we had, you know, like we participated in so far as observing because you have people who are, who, who, who participate within the procession and just are there, like you said, are, are, are there because of the procession and just being part of the, of, of that gathering. And then there are people who are, it almost seemed like they were, I don't want to say like performers, but they were kind of known as the people who were going to be engaging in this more flagrant um, kind of behavior. And, 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 and they're kind of, they, they occupy a certain place in the procession, whereas others who were more, say, bystanders or doing more symbolic gestures were elsewhere. So it, it was very, uh, it was organized in that sense, but it, it, this is something that happens annually in Hyderabad um, and to, to, to much fanfare. Uh, obviously this year with social distancing and COVID and all, I, I don't think they had one, but uh, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my, my, my mom uh, wanted to take me too, but I, I wasn't feeling well that day, but my siblings went, so yeah, I didn't get to experience that. But yeah, just as we wrap, uh, I mean, this has been a, Imam Hadi, this has been a definitely yeah. super, I mean, we got we got three hours went by super fast. It did. And, and it was a you know, confirmation of what we knew and clarification and, and education on what we, maybe what we didn't know or gaps. Um, just kind of as we wrap, I'm, you know, I, I, I've always said to, just in, to myself that, wouldn't it be great if the different Muslims in America, whether it's cultural or even, you know, Sunni, Shia, got along, right? And got together, right? Strength in numbers. Um, what, as, as a, you know, as a, as a PhD student with Dr. Jackson um, and as an imam who's probably dealing with a lot of young people, just as we have, I'm, I'm wondering, like, what are you saying um, out there in terms of, hope for Muslims kind of coming together. I mean, this, and the three of us have come this conversation, this is a tiny little microcosm and for the listeners who hopefully will learn something and see something in a new way. But what's, what's your hope? So, um, I and, think and that, if, if yeah. I could, sorry, I, yeah, I, I'm going to just yeah, like, well. like interject to that question or, or in that question and, and just say that by no means does, you know, uh, does just, getting along necessarily mean that we need to brush aside our differences, right? I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in unity, but not uniformity. I'm also a firm be believer in pluralism. And the idea of pluralism, at least the way that it is uh, actually defined, is where we where where black and white can remain black and white. They don't need to necessarily become fused or, or diluted into a monochromatic gray, right? Uh, and so, you know, we can uphold, we can maintain differences, um, and yet at the same time, we can come together on issues that bring us together and work towards a common good. I mean, so, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that's the spirit that I, I, I think that, uh, where I, I I hope that there's that there's real value in in these kind of conversations. I, I, look, Parviz, I think you said it really really well. Um, you know, I mean, we have to kind of uh, uh, understand that. Look, uh, the history of Islam is a history of diversity of views, of beliefs, of practices. I mean, this is just reality. Um, within Shiism, there is enormous diversity. Within Sunnism, there is enormous diversity. 
Uh, and until we uh, learn about this, uh, uh, we cannot come to appreciate it. Uh, I think that the first step is that we really get together and we just listen to each other. And, and, and this is look, this is the, the command of the Quran. The Quran uh, says, uh, uh, give glad tidings to my servants. الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ لِلْقَوْلِ أو الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَةً Those who, they are defined as those who listen and then they accept and they sort of follow what is best. But first yeah. they have to listen. You know, you can't follow, we cannot agree or disagree before we actually listen to each other, before we actually learn from one another. And I think especially, this is especially important as Muslims, as American Muslims. I mean, look, we complain about Islamophobia. We complain about people not knowing what Islam is because they go to, you know, anti-Muslim sources. They go to sources and communities and people who have an anti-Muslim agenda for their information about Islam. We complain about this. We say, hey, listen, if you want to learn about Islam, come to us, ask us, you know, talk to us, right? Watch us pray, you know, live with us, communicate with us. I think that as Muslims, if we really want to be able to uh, get along, if you will, we have, to, um, we have to be able to come together and learn from one another. Uh, learn about one another from one another. Uh, and, and to have these difficult, com I know these conversations are difficult, some of them. They're, they're complex, they're sensitive. But we have to be able to at least listen to each other, understand the other, and then we can, you know, agree to disagree. We can sort of say, oh, that doesn't make sense. I don't want to listen to that. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to believe in that, or I do want to believe in that, whatever. It doesn't matter. We have to first kind of listen to each other first. And that's, that's, that's only when we can uh, begin to appreciate one another and, and to recognize, hey, listen, we have common challenges and common opportunities and that we can work towards sort of uh, working towards those opportunities and, and, and in the face of those common challenges. You know, in that spirit and, 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 to, and to kind of a call back to something we talked about earlier and to just reference someone once again who is near and dear to all three of us um, is Dr. Sherman Jackson. And, and, and the anecdote that I wanted to share, uh, Imam Hadi, slightly different, although or I should say a, a variant, a variance to your uh, anecdote, which is I remember uh, and this I experienced firsthand, which is um, it, Dr. Jackson uh, led us in prayer, uh, and, and this was like a retreat. Um, Omar, I think you were at that retreat. Um, yep, I yeah, remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. <laughs> this is the uh, famous retreat. Dr. Omar has talked about it on the show. Other people have as well. But anyway, there was a retreat, uh, Imam Hadi, that we held. Uh, you know, it's called Islam in America, and, and Dr. Jackson was one of the keynotes or one of the speakers that we had for like a four-day in intensive um, retreat. But uh, he led us in one of the prayers, and like the Malikis. He ended us with one with one salam, right? He did, with one taslim, assalamu alaikum, and that was the end of the prayer. And there was so many in the gathering, right, who had never prayed behind a maliki, who were just completely befuddled, like they had no idea. Had the prayer finished? Did Doctor Jackson forget? Did he have a some kind of right? Like, like what was it? And Doctor Jackson gets up and and he said, look. I did that on purpose, even though often when I lead sort of, you know, uh, uh, what is it like, like diverse uh, gatherings such as this, I, I usually do the two Taslims because that's sort of standard, standard practice. But I was deliberate here because I want you to experience diversity. I want you to experience that there are different ways that are legitimate, that are, that are consistent with the, you know, with Sharia. Uh, and he was making a point about how, Unfortunately, a lot of us are uh, illiterate, are Islamically illiterate when it comes to our own tradition. And I think that level of literacy, or in this case, illiteracy, is, um, is uh, what's the word, exacerbated when it comes to the Shi-Sunni divide, right? Um, and so, yeah, like you said, opportunities where we can come together, where we can sit with one another, um, and, and really, you know, allow us to share our own tradition on our own terms, um, like Dr. Jackson, right? Doing the Taslim, the Maliki way, and just telling everyone else, hey, man, you know, deal with it and or, or know that this is one way to do it. So uh, I just wanted to kind of leave with that. Uh, um, but uh, 
I can't thank you enough, Imam Hadi. Uh, you know, we're approaching, yeah, we're approaching over three hours. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I, 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 I imagine I, I share and I echo what our listeners are saying, which is what an invaluable contribution that you've brought to the, to, to the podcast. Um, where can people engage you? Where can people find you? Do you, do you have kind of a social media presence uh, or whatever, if you want to share that? Or we'd love yeah, to hear that. Yeah, yeah. For, well, first of all, thank you to both of you, Parviz and Omar. I mean, I really enjoyed our conversation uh, together, and this was a great opportunity. Um, I am online. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook, Hadi Khazwini. Uh, I do have a website, some of my academic stuff on there, but I'm planning actually to launch a blog and a YouTube channel. Uh, so, you know, if you follow me online, look out uh, for, for those. Inshallah, God willing, yeah, that'd be great. Um, and 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 please do encourage you know people who do follow you. Uh, we'd love it if you do share this episode with your audience as well. We want you know we want the word to spread not only about the show. Uh, we always thank our listeners. We always encourage our listeners to go visit our Patreon page to become a patron of the show. But uh, do reach out to us, diffusecongruence at gmail dot com. Any questions? Any comments? Um, in, in fact, I think one of the Facebook comments that we got after David's episode, uh, even before I reached out to Jihad, uh, Imam uh, Hadi, um, was actually someone saying, hey, um, this is my Imam in my local community. Our, our, our kids go to the same school. Uh, you know, you got to get him on the show. Uh, and I'm drawing a bl- I, I, I have to look it up as to who it is. But um, anyway, you came recommended even before I, I, I proposed the idea to Jihad. So thank again, you. thank you. And uh, yeah. Please do check out Imam Hadi's writings. Um, follow him on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, follow us on Twitter and Facebook and, you know, encourage others to do so. Omar, any closing thoughts? Just just echoing uh, Imam Hadi, just echoing Professor's gratitude. And it was, it was um, super, super, super enlightening, super ben- beneficial. And inshallah, I hope to... Hope to uh, Meet you and meet you one day and uh, cross paths in Charleston. Inshallah. Inshallah. And, uh, yeah. Thank you, listeners, for listening to that mammoth of an episode. But I hope I think you, like us, learned a lot. And uh, we look forward to catching you on our next episode of uh, Diffuse Congruence. We hope that it won't be as long of, a, of an episode, but we hope it's that, that it's just as meaningful and just as engaging. So uh, check out for like look out for our next episode. Thanks as always for listening. We'll catch you again next time. I'm <laughs> <laughs>